Man United are coming out to play at the MCG for a couple of games <laughs> in July. And one of their former players has stopped by live in the studio, uh, star striker for Manchester United, a career that spanned a long time across a number of clubs. Dwight York is in the house. Dwight, thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, it's uh, really a uh, pleasure to to be here, um, although it's a little bit early for me, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's all good. What time do you usually get out of bed? Uh, at my age now, yeah, I get up whenever I feel like, but certainly not at <laughs> seven, six o'clock in the morning. It's just ridiculous, really, to be quite honest. Well, that's what we that's oh, why we're so thrilled to have you. So what brings you out to Australia and Melbourne? Well, well um, we're here to, to obviously promote uh, Man United coming out here uh, alongside Crystal Palace. But um, being in Melbourne, an iconic city that is renowned for their sports, um, iconic stadium at the MCG, so... Really exciting time, and I know it's been a difficult time, certainly in recent years in terms of the pandemic. So it's good to see Australia opening up again, and United want to contribute to the fans and the, the global audience that we um, engage with. How do you go getting around the world? Do, do, do you get much... Uh, do, do people say, that's Dwight York. I mean, I know you've just been to America. You've had a bit of a whirlwind trip uh, to <laughs> yeah. get out of here, get out to Melbourne. How, how do you go with recognition? Yeah, listen, I'm, I mean, I've, I've stopped playing probably, what, uh, 13 years ago or something like that. So it's it's kind of surreal that, you know, football has been so much part of your, your life for such a long time. And you think when you finish the game, you kind of walk away from it. Um, and, yeah, I have to be honest with you, still even to this day when I walk the streets, people do remember me. So I have obviously I've done something okay in the game. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, it's pretty cool still that does happen. doesn't happen as often as you used to when you were a player, which is understandable, but still, nevertheless, uh, with such an iconic uh, team that I played for globally, uh, people do remember probably the most historical moment in the history of the, the, the club as well. The last time Man United played in Melbourne was in 99. They took on the Socceroos. Were you involved in that? Were you were you part of that group? So you didn't do your research then, hey? Kane. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, we came out the, the, that particular year because of what we've done in, in world football. We have done something that no other British team has been able to do, which is to win the treble. Um, so we won the three major trophies, and mm -hmm. that was my first year as a Man United player. And so, yeah, um, to actually come out on a global stage after that, and we came down to Australia in celebration of it. Um, it was a big, big, big tour down here. So what was the experience like <laughs> playing on the G? Um, packed out MCG, 100,000. How did it compare to the other massive, you know, passionate crowds that you play in front of in Europe? Yeah, well, it's 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 a little bit different. Don't forget the Champions League final. We had roughly close to 100,000 ourselves at uh, the Barcelona Stadium uh, playing against Bayern Munich. So we kind of used to that kind of numbers. And at Old Trafford, probably the biggest stadium in in Britain as well, so we get 70-odd 70, 70 thousand there. So we're used to the, the big crowd. Uh, but MCG, obviously iconic, Australian, a little bit different, not renowned for their their football, you call it soccer, which I, I still find it strange, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's the MCG, which is which is a, a renowned stadium. I'm fascinated by the, the personalities, like Sir Alex Ferguson mm. and David Beckham and these yeah. people. Do you still have contact with those guys do, you know, in the in the afterlife now that you've moved on a little bit? You've, you've been through America. Did you catch up? Do you catch up with these people? Yeah, I mean the thing is, you know, there are certain things that you can't get uh, away from. These are players that we, as a as a group, accomplish something that no other team has been able to do. So that personal connection still does exist, although it's maybe not quite as tight as when we were playing. But you still can pick up the phone and speak to these various people. Beck's always on hand if you need a call or if you need something. He might need something from me. You never know. So, uh, yeah, I would like to think that Swanix Ferguson has always always been there. He's always been the father figure in, in sport. <clears throat> Even at his retirement, he gives uh, those advice. You can pick the phone up. You can have those conversations if you need to, if you need a recommendation and he thinks it's worthwhile. You'll also be on hand to do that. So, you know, yeah, I, I think that the, the 99 team is always going to be mm -hmm. in close close to getting this, um, even to this day. Was, it, was there one bit of advice that he gave you as a player, or what was he like as a, as a coach for you personally in your prime? Well, the thing is, when I joined the club, um, I came in, uh, even though I was playing for Aston Villa, I, I've been in the Premier League for nearly 10 years. I, I started when the Premier League started in 1992, 
So I was making my name and, and way through the game. And uh, although the, the success I had at Aston Villa, I wanted more. I wanted to be at the, the very top. And, and Man United did, did present that with Sir Alex Ferguson, the players that I was playing like, with, the manager who I was playing for, what the club represent, the history of the, the football club. So I needed a platform, and, and so Alex Ferguson present me with that. And the, the one thing I remember when I went there, he said, don't change. Be who you are, be yourself, and just go express yourself. Go enjoy. You know, this is a moment for you to embrace, enjoy it. And although I had a huge price tag on my head at the, that particular time, never really occurred for one minute because so Alex Ferguson may gone out his way, make sure I was comfortable, make sure I embedded into the team, embraced the challenge that was ahead, and it was just a fantastic moment. And, of course, we went on to win the treble that year. I finished top scorer, player of the year, mm. you name it. It was uh, probably the, the best, obviously, the best time in my playing career. How did you handle the pressure that comes with that and the scrutiny? And if you are having a bad run and you haven't scored for a few weeks, the pressure that builds up, you personally, have you got any tips on how to handle that? Yeah, well, I, you know what? I, I, listen, I come from the Caribbean, and, and if you... If you know my background, come from a family of nine. We lived in a, a two-bedroom house. Really struggled. Probably didn't have meals occasionally on the, the, the table to feed everyone. But I came from a, a very happy family upbringing. And even though, because that's the world I lived in, so I don't see playing football. And often enough, a lot of people use this in in sports. I don't see it as pressure. I've never used the word pressure. I don't never use the word pressure lightly. And the simple reason. One, if we win, lose, or draw, I still get paid. You know, so how that could possibly be pressure? Mm. Expectation, yes. Mm. When you play at such a big club, people expect you to perform, and if you don't, you get criticized. But when you can't pay your mortgage and you, you can't provide for your kids and stuff, for me, that, that's what you consider pressure. But playing sport and still get paid whether you lose, win, or draw, um, I, don't, I don't really use that word too lightly, and, and, and that's always been my approach. Melbourne Victory will take on Manchester United at the MCG Friday, July the 15th, before United plays Crystal Palace on Tuesday, July the 19th. Superstar Dwight York joining us live in the studio. What about the personalities, the egos, the money, the fame? <laughs> oh, like, how yeah. did that all yeah. gel in the locker room? And how did, you, how did you make it work with all those factors and challenges? Well, the one common factor when we're in the dressing room that we're all there for one reason. And one reason only is to play for Manchester United, give your best all the time, and to win trophies, ultimately. And I think once you, as a manager, and you've gone into a team dressing room, a team format, once everybody's on the same page, it's the manager's job to make sure that everyone is interacting, everybody gets on, and the same ultimate, uh, the same things that you're trying to achieve in the game, that we're all on the same page with it. And I think that's the, the job of the manager. Forget the egos. You're always going to go into dressing room. You're never going to get on with everyone else. You've got to like some people, dislike some people. But ultimately, when we are teammates and you've got to do what's right for the team. And I think that's the general assessment of when you're in a, in a, in a dressing room. Too serious, Kane. Too serious. Are you aware of this man's <laughs> nickname? All Night Dwight. <laughs> I love it. I reckon one of my favourite nicknames. Mm. Tell us about life off-field, away uh, from away from the coach and the Man City, uh, sorry, the Man U staff. What yeah, was it like? Um, well, I must have had a good night. I think it could be all night, Dwight. I'm not sure that still does exist, but I must have had a, a really unbelievable night to be called the all, all night, Dwight. So it, it, it was, uh, it, it could be worse, right? It could when be you worse. think about it, but um, no, I... I don't know how that name really stuck with me. I, I think there was a, a young lady back in the days I was <laughs> dated and she, you know, the tabloids uh, and came out with this story. She, she, she did a story on me and she oh. said, oh, he was all night Dwight and the night. And somehow <laughs> um, that kind of stuck with, with well, me. Well, it's not the first. worst, let's yeah, be honest. That's what I said. So that's what it means. So, yeah. so how do you handle it? the tabloids? I mean, we, we've had to live this a little mm. bit through Shane Warne, who yep. we've, we've celebrated and unfortunately he's no longer with us, but we've celebrated him this week. He put up with a lot with the tabloids. Did you, did you struggle with that? Did you find that difficult? Um, well, you, you never really um, prepare for that sort of you know, journey as, you know, being interrogated or being followed by the, the, the paparazzi, as we call it, back in the UK. Obviously, that's down to your success as a footballer and probably people who you date outside of it. And there is an attraction in, in that. 
you know, I know Shane. I've met him a couple of times, and I understand his lifestyle. And and footballers, myself included, have lived that type of lifestyle. You've been single. You're dating a beautiful uh, model. Um, the press is always interested in that, and um, they make this. They made a story out of that, and they make the living out of that. People, there are lots of people out there who like that sort of stuff without knowing the truth. People write about you without any sort of credibility about it. But that's part and parcel of being in the spotlight. You have to deal with it. Um, and, and the way to deal with it is not to read the, the tabloids. And, I, and that's the way I find that I, I got a lot of uh, satisfaction from not giving them the opportunity to, to read the, the, the tabloids. Now, we had a quick chat outside. Can you just tell us a little bit about your, the golf as you've been coming <laughs> around the world? You've, you've played with a couple of reasonable competitors <laughs> yeah well I, again the, the fact that um you know you play for united you've done what you've done in the game you get to meet other sports personality and golf is a, a big interest you you probably i think 90 percent of the retirement sportsmen they they all pick up uh, golf it's a, it's a way to still keep competitive and of course living in europe you know you get to meet all these european players um sergio garcia is a good friend of mine you got the likes of Rory McIlroy, those guys, um, just to name a few, um, have it, happened to play a couple of rounds with these guys and hang out with them. And recently I was in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, hanging out with Rory, playing some golf down there. He's getting prepared for the Masters. Um, Realise that my games is not nowhere near as good as these guys, but uh, there's some work to be done there. But um, yeah, play Michael Jordan golf courses. So, you know, the, the, the perks of... Um, success as a footballer, you get awesome. to to meet all these other awesome. unbelievable sportsmen. Oh, Dwight, it's a it's a big big life. We thank you for promoting this upcoming tour for Man United. Thank you for stopping by and getting up early for us, and it's been a great chat. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Go on here, Dwight. Dwight right. York live in the studio. Did, now, did you, general... did, hang on, did you get did you beat Rory or not? Did you win? No, he beat three of us together. <laughs> 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 general public on sale Monday the fourth of April at two PM. Go to tickettech.com.au. Dwight York was our guest live in the studio.